Yo, what's good? On this episode of the podcast, I had Richard Specht. Rich is a veteran of the United States Navy and an English teacher here in Shanghai. This podcast, we talked a lot about life in the military, skateboarding, and living in Shanghai. Please give it up for Richard Specht. In the land of China, people hardly got nothing at all. No possessions? And in China, they never go to church. No religion, too? I do magic. Well, it's easy if you try, Dick. Three, two, one. Okay, we're live. Uh, how are you doing, Rich? Thanks for coming over. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Of course. So this is your last month in China. This is my last week last in week. China. I leave next Wednesday. Hmm. You, so you already booked the flights home, back to America? Three months ago. It's been a countdown since that day. Really? But I mean, I figured because, you know, it, buy your tickets early, it'll be a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. So I just basically planned it to the end of my semester at school because mm -hmm. I'm teaching English. And um, yeah, I just did it like so I leave the day before my visa expires. Nice. Oh, wow. Couldn't yeah. get that close. I guess it doesn't really matter as long as you're out here on the day. They don't care. Well, the way my school does it, they do it weird, man. Like the it, visa expires the last day of school, mm. the last day of work. Oh, really? Yeah. And then if I sign a new contract with them, then they start it the next day. So when mm. I come back after summer vacation, then it'll go from 621. So basically, if I wanted to stay here after the last day of work, I'd have to get like a humanitarian visa. Oh, yeah. That's super annoying. Yeah, it is. But whatever. Yeah, well, you're kind of wrapping it up. How long How long have you been here again? Um, this October would be four years, mm. so a hot minute, yeah. I feel like. Not as long as like Charlie or mm. some other people, but four years I feel like is a good chunk of time. Right, yeah. I think like you either get to the point of four years or you kind of will just like be here forever. It seems like, you know, Charlie and Jammer, they just are lifers in a sense. Well- before I came to Shanghai, actually, I was in my mind, I was like, okay, I'll do it for two years mm. and then I'll leave. Mm. I just wanted the two years experience or just to see what it was like. And then, you know, after two years, you're like, damn, two years went by already. Like I'll give it another year. Mm. And then I gave it another year, but now I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I feel you. So you, you got here four years ago. What, what inspired, what inspired you to come to China in the first place? I don't know if you know this, you probably do. A lot of people do. I used to live in Tokyo right, before I came yeah. here. Um, I was studying at university, Temple University in Tokyo. Um, the mm. main campus is in Philly. Yeah, I'm familiar with the Philly um, campus. But they have a Japan campus. And I had mm. a friend from Maryland. He was studying there. Mm. And um, when I was in the Navy, I was still in Italy at the time. Mm. And he was going to the university in Japan. Mm. So I was like, well, shit, I want to live in Japan. So <laughs> I, um, I applied there. Yeah. I got into the university. And then while we were out there, um, you know, every skateboarder's dream is to come skate China. Sure. Sure. And me and my homie, we were like, man, it is just right there. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And, um, we first came because my homie's f brother, mm. no, he either knows or knows of Dolly. Oh, Brian yeah. Brian Dolly. So um, his brother put us in contact with... Oh, should I not do that? No, oh, it's all good. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You were looking at it like, what? <laughs> well, so he put us in contact with Dolly. Mm. And um, so we were calling Dolly via Skype. Mm. And it took him forever to answer the phone. Right, at Dolly. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, the homie was like... Um, because he didn't know them. We, neither of us knew Dolly. So mm. we just hit Dolly up. And then Dolly's like, yeah, dude, you know, come on out. <laughs> skate with us. And we're like, cool. So we had a point of contact. So we came to Shanghai to skate. Me, my good homie, uh, one of my Brazilian Japanese homies. And maybe just us three the first time. I don't know. Mm. It was like six years ago. And we had all these expectations. We were like not sure of China, mm. you know, it, with it you know, it's history and all that. Sure, so sure. we were like, oh, we're just going to keep it chill. We'll just follow the local guys around, see what's good. Mm. And it was completely different than what we had imagined. Like everyone's at LP rolling up. And so this was six years ago? The yeah. First? So you man. came here first to visit before you, you lived here? Twice. We oh. came here twice to visit. Okay. I didn't know that. So 
Yeah, um, the first time we met Dolly and Jay, like we first met up at Jay's old restaurant, <laughs> Homies. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it was super sick. We all got breakfast, and then we went skating after. And then, um, so we met a lot of dudes, and then we came again a second time, met some more dudes. And then what inspired me to come is um, I graduated from university, and I wanted to move to California with my ex Japanese girlfriend. Mm. Things didn't work out. Sure. So I was kind of on the fence about what to do. I had no idea. I was like, I don't want to live in California. Is this after the military or this was after the military. Okay. First military, then university, now oh, yeah. here. Okay. So I was like, well, I don't want to move to California. Like, I don't know anyone there. That sounds like crap. So mm. I was talking to Jay via WeChat when I was in Japan. I had oh. three days left until my flight. I already booked my flight to LA. Mm. And three days before I left, I'm talking to Jay. And I'm like, man, uh, like me and my girlfriend, we split. Things aren't going as planned. Um, I just don't know what to do. Mm. And he was like, dude, just come to Shanghai and <laughs> teach English and yeah. skate with the homies. And it'll be sick. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> I will. Yeah. And so I hit my mom up and I was like, I'm not moving back. I'm going to China. And my mom's <laughs> like, what the? F and I, I was like, yeah, well, that's what I want to do. So I went back to the States for a little bit because, yeah. you know, I had to wait for my diploma to come in the mail. Sure. I got my teaching certificate. That's I applied process, for the yeah. job. And then I had to wait for the job to apply for my visa. And then I had to wait for them to send it to me and then get my uh, visa done on the Chinese embassy in DC because mm. I was staying in Maryland. Right, right. And that was like a five month process. Mm. And then once everything worked out, I finally got here Sick. in October 2015. Awesome. It's a long road to get to China. And I used to tell people like, everyone should do this. It's an amazing opportunity. Like, why wouldn't you come just teach English in China? But I realized it's kind of foolish to say that because not everyone wants this crazy challenge. Like were there points along the way where you're like, this is just not worth it. Like the visa issues and that kind of stuff. Like what was your feeling along that road? No, um, it was long process. I understand that, but there was mm. never a time where I just wanted to quit. Mm. I was very determined. Right. When I, I'm the kind of guy, I don't procrastinate when mm. I want something done, I'll do it. Mm. I understood that it took a long time. The longest part was maybe waiting for my diploma to come in the mail. Cause you know, you can't get a job here without a copy of that. Like you sure. definitely need a four year course, diploma. Yeah. And then I was spending my other free time getting my teaching certificate. Hmm. And then when I finally completed all the classes, they had to mail that certificate to me. Hmm. And that came from like Thailand or something. It was Whoa. weird. I did it online. And then I, <laughs> One day I get a package from Thailand. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then, you know, it was that. Yeah. And then finally, once I had all that material, then I applied for the job at Web. Mm. Um, I was talking to Asian Dave. Sure. At the time, I didn't know him. I think I met him the second time I came to Shanghai. But um, I was talking to him. So I knew of him, but I didn't know Justin mm. and Asian Dave put me in with Justin. Right. And because they were, Dave was doing part-time and Justin was full-time at web. Mm. So I was like, okay, I'll just get that job, whatever. Yeah, easy. So once I had all that, I applied for that job, then had an interview with him. And then, you know, it was just a bunch of waiting around. So I was just chilling at home with my mom back in Maryland. I was just skating, doing a part-time job as a mm. waiter just to earn some extra cash. But yeah, no, there was never a time I was like, screw this, because yeah, I just understood it was a long process. Right. Something I want to go back to, you you mentioned like your determinism and how like motivated you are to get something. So you come from a military background. Yeah. Another thing I was does your is your family military as well? Both my parents were Air Force. My uncle was Air Force and um I feel like someone else was, but yeah, sure. definitely so you, them. So your family is military. And I, mm. I find this very interesting because a lot of my high school friends or almost all of my high school friends, none of them come from a military background. And I, I feel like that's a big part of American culture actually is for, you know, some families to just be in the military. And 
one of my friends right now. And the first time I got exposed to that, you know, way to live life. I look at that as a way, like a, they called him like, okay, so I'll go back a little bit. My friend was also in the military in Japan. And I met his friends while I was out there. And it was called like, he, he said his, the term was a military brat. Have mm-hmm. you ever heard that? What is it oh, called? Yeah. Military brat. It's called a military brat. So like you may have been labeled a military brat as a kid. If you were, your parents are traveling around from base to base. Is that, can you explain to me what a military brat is? And um, just like, getting into a little bit about what it's like to be a military family. A military brat is basically just a term for a child who's either one or two parents are in the military. Mm. And um, they don't have to travel because some people can get stationed at one base for almost their entire career. Mm. Just so happens, um, mine didn't. We moved around a lot. Plus, my parents divorced at an early age. Mm. So... Like I was born in Germany I think because I of that. Yeah. I mean, my last name's German. I'm German descent, sure. but I'm American. Like, so it's just a coincidence. They met in Germany and I was born there mm. on an mil- American military base. Mm. So I'm an American citizen. Oh, is that yeah. the differentiation? If you were born on a military base, you'll get that U.S. passport. Let's say you weren't born on the U.S. base. Would that have been like a, a problem, air quotes, for the future or? No. I think because both my parents are American. So you still get the American passport. I could have still yeah. got it. Sure. I think even being born on a base, I'm still eligible for a German passport. It's interesting. But I, I looked into it for a little while, but it basically came down to when I was going to live in Germany again. Yeah. And I was Does like, well. Does it really matter? Mm. And then I was like, it's not really worth it, whatever. Mm. So uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so just a kid whose parents are in the military is all it is. Mm. Yeah, and so. Then, you asked me a second question. I asked you just like, okay, so where were you born oh. again? Like, I just want to know about um, life moving around and like, and, and that kind of oh, lifestyle yeah. is just so different from. Yeah. You asked I'm- me about what the life was like. Um, I was born in Bitborg, Germany. Mm. Um, I don't remember it. We left before I was two years old. Mm. So my earliest memory, uh, we went to North Carolina after okay. that, uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina. Mm. Faintly remember that because. I would spend my very early childhood there. And I think around, it was, yeah, when I started, when I finished third grade, we moved to Abilene, Texas. Hmm. Right. And this is how I know you as like a Texas kid. Yeah. I spent most of my childhood in Texas. Hmm. Sorry. So I went to um, fourth grade to halfway through ninth grade living in Texas. But, um, Even then, like we moved to Abilene and then I think early middle school, I moved to a town outside of Abilene, like in the sticks. Mm. We lived in the country, like there was nothing out there. And then I went to like this little hick middle school full of all these rednecks. And I was like, oh, but it was okay. I mean, I was still kind of too young at the time to really know. Sure. So we were in the sticks. We were in the boonies up until I was halfway through ninth grade. And mm. then I we moved to Maryland. But when I was um in fourth grade, my parents got divorced. Mm. My dad moved over to Tucson, Arizona. Mm-hmm. So I spent every summer vacation in the hottest city <laughs> in America with my dad. Oh, my God. Well, the second hottest. Phoenix is the first hottest. So yeah, imagine that like growing up as a kid skateboarding. You and- did tell me that you said you couldn't, you would just wait until nighttime because it's just, it's in, you can't go outside during the day. When I was a kid, it never bothered me. Yeah. But um, when I went back to visit him while I was living in Japan, mm. going outside before 8 p.m. <laughs> was not an option. It was not an option. It was not an option. It's horrible. Mm. So yeah, when I was a kid, I, I we just did it. I don't know how, but mm. we always made it happen. Sure, as a kid, nothing bothers you. No, That's all I wanted to do was skate. So it's hard for me to describe what the experience was like and how it differs from other. Right, because you can't compare it to anything yeah. else. Because I've I think I've always it's thought been your life. It's yeah. Yeah, I've always thought um people who grew up who were born in one town and grew up in this one town and still live in this one town must have the dullest lives ever because they don't get out to see anything the only thing 
that it hinders for me is friendships. Like mm. it was really hard to constantly be going to new school to new school and making new friends. Definitely. That was the hardest thing in mm. the world for me to do until I found skateboarding. Sure. And then it was really easy for me to make friends. So when did you start skating? At what age? Um, I was playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. <laughs> sure. And because I was a kid, I played tons of video games and somehow I got this video game. So I want to say it was eighth grade, I mm. believe. Um, my sister had a skateboard. It was some Walmart board. It was a piece of junk. And she used it from time to time, but she never really got the hang of it. Mm. So she just gave up and it was sitting in her closet. And then some of my friends in middle school started skateboarding and trying ollies and 180s or whatever with just kids screwing around. And yeah. I liked the game and I was like, you know, what? I want to try this too. It could be fun. Mm. So my sister gave me her board and I remember hugging her and kissing her and I was <laughs> so happy. I was so stoked. I was like, I got a skateboard. So eighth grade, middle of eighth grade. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I remember getting mine. I, it was a combination of, well, actually the first time I, I was just given a skateboard growing up in New York city. My, um, like we had an au pair, someone that like, like a nanny and her nephew just gave me this old busted up five burrow. And it was like literally like chipping at the nose and the mm. tail, like, you know, the plies were coming apart, but it was just given to me. And I was so excited. Like what? You gave me a skateboard. Cause you would see people skating in the street and you're like, how is that possible that they're just yeah. like ollieing up curbs and to just get one. I was so excited. And you know, would go to the local park, learn how to drop in. What what, what was the um, environment like for you, like friend wise? Like, how did you, you said you made friends so easily. So where so, were you again when you got the, what city, town? It was card, a uh, card. It was called Merkel, Texas. Okay. So we're in Texas at this point when you get, oh, yeah. eighth grade. Eighth so grade. Going we're in Booneyville, U.S. Well, see, this is the thing. I told you we lived in the boonies, mm. so I couldn't just go skateboarding. Oh, I wait. had to wait for my mom at her single mom convenience mm. to be able to drive me into town to go to the skate park. So you did have a skate park at least. It so, wasn't close, but you had a skate park. It wasn't close. It was like a 20 minute drive at least mm. away. So in my free time, I was mostly by myself practicing ollies in the grass. Mm. Yeah, deal. you mentioned this and like in the mud and the, you just deal like putting wood on the grass and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I, we went, whenever we went into town, we would go to Home Depot or Lowe's or something and I would save up my allowance to buy pieces of plywood and I would just <laughs> lay them down in the grass just so I had something to roll on because, you know, was, we only had dirt roads. That's crazy, so yeah. it was hard. So as for making friends, it was um, when I started in eighth grade, it was, I already had these friends. I had been there since sixth grade. I had, you know, obviously made friends with these guys already. So mm. we just all kind of started together. But a year later, halfway through ninth grade, we moved to Waldorf, Maryland. Okay. Southern Maryland. Um, mm. Small little town, nothing going on. So when I went to the high school there, I basically just saw some guys carrying skateboards at school and I just started talking to them. Mm. And uh, it just so happens the local skate shop was just around the corner from my high school. So they're like, hey, let's go to the Central. And I'm like, what the hell is Central? And they're like, oh, it's a skate shop. And I was like, sick. So we went over there, hung out, and met all the dudes. And, you know, it was still a little hard to get in, like, with the skate shop guys. Sure. Anyways, because, you know, everyone's a cool guy. Mm. But at least with the my friends from school, it was very easy. easy yeah. And then we were just homies instantly. So sick. I I think that's one of the most beautiful things about skateboarding is you you tend to be able to find – what's called the center or LP in Shanghai, you know, like it's, it seems that kids are easily accepting when it comes to skateboarding. They just want more friends. They want to see people go, do cool stuff. And it just made me realize like how important that could be to a community. Like I think the biggest problems for some of my, the biggest problem for my community was we didn't have a rec center or, and it sounds so lame to have a rec center, but if you have a central spot where people can come and just meet up, I think it can be so beneficial to kids growing up and stuff like that. So it seemed like your rec center was the center, the center skate shop. Yeah, it definitely was. And, you know, I played lots of team sports when I was a kid. I played mm. football, uh, American football. <laughs> uh, I've been abroad a minute. Sure. Um, 
uh, baseball, mm. um, basketball, mm. and I hated all of that shit. Yep. And, you know, my mom had almost given up on me. I would quit everything because, you know, I just wasn't into it. Yeah. Like, I was still doing it with my friends because they were like um, school sports. Mm-hmm. But skateboarding definitely gave me the freedom and the ability to do what I wanted to do Mm -hmm. and not follow like team rules. And it was way better than any of those other team sports had given me. For sure. For sure. For me, it was the same thing. I, um, I tried football. I fucking hated it. I got Mm. tackled once and I was like, this is stupid. You're killing yourself for nothing. But I did, um, really enjoy wrestling in high school. I, I actually was really good at it. And it was the perfect combination of like, you have team camaraderie while mm-hmm. you're all on the same team, but you're you're up, like facing another team, like another school. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, like you get to train with a group of people, but the actual sport, it comes down to like one person. Yeah. And I think that's always translated to skateboarding as well as you don't need a team, but it's, it's so much fun to go out with the homies and, you know, find a new spot and session, blah, blah, blah. Cause like you can either just go to the spot one, just you and your board flat ground and you, you can literally skate for hours if, if you're so motivated for wrestling, you, you, I did need like another opponent, but yeah, I, I think there, that's something about a person is like they can fall into two camps. Mm-hmm. One of the camps could be like, it's totally great if you enjoy rest, uh, sorry, basketball, football, soccer, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. More power to you. Yeah. It's like, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, um, it's so important to find which one is good for you at a young age. I think, mm. I think it takes a long time for people to, to, to figure out which side they're on or like what their interests are. So for some reason, skateboarders seem to find it at such a young age. And it's, it's just, well, no matter what the activity is, like if you're able to find that at a young age, it's, it's so beneficial to your future. And I almost, and my mom was very supportive of, of it. Supportive. Mm. Yeah. Supportive of it because, you know, she was a little skeptical at first to buy me my skateboard because I had quit everything else. And she was like, am I going to buy you a skateboard and you're just going to quit as soon as you begin? But, you know, I guess, you know, it was just kind of that time in your young life where you're just trying all these new things and Mm -hmm. you're just trying to figure out what's you. Mm -hmm. And I found skateboarding and there was nothing else that compared. And I'd have to say skateboarding basically saved my life. Mm. It was because, you know, I was young, overweight, um, skateboarding got me outside Mm. exercising all the time led to so many friendships and to this day um i want to say i was 14 when i started to this day i'm 29 30 in two months and i'm still doing it hell yeah yeah that's awesome and it it like opens the door to traveling it it really gives you such a easy in with certain groups of people in different countries i wouldn't be in shanghai if i didn't skateboard Mm. It wouldn't have happened. I would have never came to China the first time. I would have never, I wouldn't be living here now. Mm. And yeah, I probably would never have went to Tokyo either because my homie was a skateboarder that I went to live with in Tokyo. So I knew him from skateboarding. So skateboarding in a way helped me Mm. go to Tokyo. Hell yeah. Same for me, actually. I wouldn't have come to China if it wasn't for skateboarding. I mean, the first job I got here was to teach at Iconics. Mm. You familiar with Iconics? Uh, somewhat. I've heard a whole mix of things. Yeah, I mean, all said and done, they've found their niche, which is to to teach kids skateboarding, and which is nothing, great. Yeah, there's thing nothing to wrong do. with that. I, and it's it's actually funny that how many people they've brought over and like boosted up the skateboard community around them. Like, mm. did you know Jay came over here? Through Iconics? No, I didn't. Jay came over here through Iconics. Um, not Tommy Jow, but um, what, John Saw, mm-hmm. myself, Brian Kleiber. Um, you know, so many people have come over here through Iconics and kind of been it, like, <laughs> it's so funny because they were trying to set up their own thing. Mm-hmm. And in the process, they built up a skateboard community around them. I found that super interesting. Which, if anything, that's admirable. Yeah, it's great. I, I I think it's it's so cool that that happened. Um, I wanted to get back to the the military a little bit. So when 
you graduated high school. Mm. Is that when you decided to join the military or? There was a few months in between. Um, I was one of those kids. I wanted to take that gap mm. year. But I was also very uncertain mm. of what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to go to college, but I didn't have money like that. Mm. You know, my mom's a single mom, just been supporting me. She barely has enough money to take care of my sister and I. And um, so it wasn't like I wasn't one of those children that my mom just had hundreds of thousands of dollars put away mm. and was able to just, you know, pay for me to go to college. I had to do it myself. So I was, um, it's funny cause I was actually had my first girlfriend, my late high school years and she was a psychopath <laughs> and I'm not saying that just to like diss women or something, but no, she was literally crazy. Like mm. she would come to my work like before like opening hours and like hide inside oh with the God. lights off and I'd open the door and turn the lights on. She's standing there in the doorway, like what the <sighs> breathing heavily. And I was just like, Oh God. And I, because uh, I was working for her brother at the time. Is this Taco Bell? No, this was a, <laughs> this was, um, she would show up at Taco Bell too. Because I was working two jobs as a high school student. Oh, shit. Like, I've been working, the day after I turned 16, I got a job mm. at Taco Bell. And then I was working part-time with her brother. It was like doing administration at a plumbing company. Okay. You know, I was, I was working for my own money at 16. Mm -hmm. So... Well, anyway, so I moved after I graduated, I moved to a town maybe an hour north with a homie I went to from high school. I lived with him and his grandfather. And I was up there for about a good three months. Mm -hmm. And I was working overnight stocking at Target. Mm -hmm. And I hated it. It was so bad. And like start at 10 o'clock at night and then finish work at seven o'clock in the morning or something Dude, like that. That is so... So you get to work and... You go to work and it's pitch dark. You wake up. I mean, you finish work and then you the sun's coming up, but you're so tired and you go home you and go sleep. You have to go back to sleep. You have to. And then you wake up and the sun's already gone again. And Living a life of darkness. <laughs> that wasn't good as a skateboarder. You know, I'd wake up and I'd have all these missed calls and all my friends are like, what Where are you doing? You? And I'm like, oh man, like I was sleeping all damn day because mm. I have to work tonight. And then I uh, sprained my ankle really bad. Uh skateboarding i was trying to like front side flip like a four stair or something mm. landed wrong and i just screwed my ankle up but um it was pretty swollen and like you know overnight stocking you have to like climb ladders and stock shit sure i couldn't do it and target wasn't hearing it they're like <laughs> they're like we don't care yeah climb that ladder yeah. and i was like fuck you guys i quit and i walked out and i left and then i was unemployed for like four weeks and um one day my friend was like, what are you doing, man? Like, you just live in here. You got no job mm. and you need to like do something. And I was like, you're right. Um, so at the same time, my cousin, mm. yeah, that's the other guy I couldn't remember. My cousin, he was in the Navy mm. and it had been like a lifelong dream to come to China and Japan. I don't know if I really knew the difference between the two when I was younger. Of course. But like... There was something about Asia that had always attracted me. Mm -hmm. Something about the, you know, the Chinese characters and the culture mm -hmm. and everything was so foreign and just different, just unique. So different, and it was yeah. just like, man, it's so it's, I've always wanted to live in Asia since I was a child. Mm -hmm. And he was in the Navy and he was living in Japan. He was stationed in Japan. And he was like, dude, you should live in, come out and live in Japan. It's so sick. Like women are beautiful and Japan's sick. And he would send me like videos. I think these were still MySpace. Yeah, they were still MySpace <laughs> no days. Way. So I was seeing videos and pictures of him on MySpace. I was like, wow, that's awesome. And then I, like I, I sat there and I thought about it and like in the afternoon, just one afternoon. Mm. And um, I was like, okay, so if I join the Navy, I can go to Japan, mm -hmm. and after I'm done, I get the GI Bill, and they sure. pay for my college. Mm. And I was um, 18 at the time, and I was like, I'm still 18. If I do my four years, I'll finish when I'm 22, and then I can go to college, and I still have my whole life. Right, so you have to do four years of Navy or military to get the GI, correct? Yeah, uh, at least three. Mm. three. Like a contract is four years, but you need at least three years with an honorable discharge sure, to sure, get out sure. on, you know, good terms mm -hmm. 
to be to get the full GI Bill. Sure. And back then it was the Montgomery GI Bill, and now it's the post 9-11 GI Bill. Hmm. We won't get into that. Just different names. Well, there was diff- there's a whole bunch of different stipulations, but it changed when I was in. Anyways, it still paid for your college. Okay. That's all that mattered. So the, literally the next morning I woke up, walked up to the recruiter's office, and there's these dudes out there smoking cigarettes, and they're like, Hey, what's up, man? Wanna join the Navy? And I was like, Yeah. And they were like, <laughs> and they were like, they were like shocked. They were like, What? And I was just like, Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and let's so do this. <laughs> we walked into the recruiter's office and um they I signed all my papers. And then, you know, it was a, it was a little bit of a process. It wasn't like I just it's woke up that day and went to the Navy that afternoon. Like there was a lot of processing. Mm-hmm. I had to check in there from time to time, take some physical fitness tests. You know, luckily as a skateboarder, like all I do is skate. So I'm, my cardio is Pretty on fit. point. Yeah. I can yeah run and do all this. I had lost all my weight mm-hmm. by then. So, well, I was still a little chunky, but I was losing weight, yeah, you're on, but I was you're still, I was way. fit. I was on my way. And then I started exercising myself. Mm. Like I had never done this. I would never have went out for a jog. Mm in high school, but I joined the Navy and I knew I was leaving soon. So I started jogging, doing push-ups, planks, all this stuff by myself Mm -hmm. on my own. And then, um, cause I had to wait for like three months because for some reason the job I got had, it was a three month waiting period before I went to boot camp. Right. So yeah, I I mean, I didn't know this, but you get assigned a job. It's not like you're just in the Navy and you're in this bucket of random people. You get, for example, my friend is a bosun mate. Yeah. What oh. were you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bosun mate is the worst, apparently. Yeah. I'm so happy. Okay. So um, you don't just get assigned a job. You take the ASVAB. ASVAB. Yeah. yeah. Which is basically like the SAT or ACT mm-hmm. for the military. And I took the ASVAB. I didn't study for it or anything. I just took it. Mm-hmm. And I got like a 44 and <laughs> but do, does the number really matter or yeah it's a test it's a test and um i went to i went back to my recruiter and i was like i got a 44 and he's like oh that's pretty good man and i was like i was like what's the highest 100? score and he was like 100 Ooh. and i was like what i was like that's an f minus dude i was like that's horrible but um there's all kinds of different um positions parts to the asvab so oh, okay. your score on your asvab basically qualifies you for different jobs. Mm -hmm. So after I took my ASVAB, I went in and I sat down with this guy and he pulled up on his computer uh, all the different jobs I was eligible for. Mm -hmm. And the first one he showed me, it's called Yeoman. Yeoman. Y-E-O-M-A-N. Yeoman. Which is basically an administrative assistant. Hmm. Not So like Boatswain's mate, I was a yeoman. Mm. Um. That it was the first one he pulled up and he like read off the job description for me. And I was like, oh, I don't really know. Can I see what else? And the dude was a total asshole. He was like, oh man, this is a good job. You just take this job, wasting your time. And I was like, fine, fuck it, whatever. Pushy. Just, just give me that one. That. I, I was like, that. just give me that one. And I was 18. I was young and dumb. And I was like, fuck it, just give me that one. Which it didn't turn out too bad in the long run because it's an admin assistant. Like, mm. so I'm chilling in an office all yeah. day. I'm not on a, I'm not a boatswain's mate. Yeah. I'm not tying boats to the pier, scraping mm. paint off the ship. So, or you cannot choose a job and you, and you can go away. in, um, oh, I forgot the word, but you can go in undesignated and that's undesignated. it. Undesignated. And then you become like the Navy's bitch. Mm. Yeah. Especially if you're an E1, which is the lowest rank. Oh Whew, Lord. Man. Yeah. Don't go in undesignated for you mm. people listening and mm. want to join the military. Don't do it. Okay. So, um, I felt like I had something else to add to that. But anyway, I, I did that and then I went to boot camp and that sucked. So yo sorry, yeoman though. Yeoman. What is oh so okay, yeoman means administrative assistant. It's basically what it is. It's just the Navy terminology for that. Okay. So um I joined the Navy. I didn't even think about it. No, I was 18. I was like, oh, I'll be on a ship. I can go from this port to be- that port and see the world. Not exactly. Um living on a <laughs> aircraft carrier those things are huge Mm. maybe there's even a skate park on it (laughs) dude i don't know what the hell i was thinking i was like (laughs) i was like oh i'll have my own room i'll be chilling it'll be like a cruise ship type deal boy was i wrong (laughs) i was so dumb i didn't even look into it or nothing this was before like you know 
maybe um, before the internet of like, no. like easily accessible yeah, easily or, accessible. or just like you knew you could just google something and but i didn't even think about it i like my cousin said he was in the navy he was in japan and i was figured the same thing could happen to me right so yeah oh boy was i wrong but i um went in and then went in boot camp and that was nine weeks long and it was just a living hell it wasn't that bad it's not like um Oh, what's that movie? Uh, a Navy movie? No, the um, Heavy Metal Jacket. Oh, it wasn't like yeah. that. Like, dudes ain't punching you in the face and, like, shooting you and shit. Like a fraternity, kind of. But so it, it is kind like of. That. Like, so you're living in a room they call a compartment with mm. 79 other dudes. Mm. Or it could be half male, half female. But mm. I was in an all-dude compartment. Mm. And it's always 79? Is it? um, 80 is the maximum. Oh. So 79 including myself. So you, you get stationed at a compartment. And, yeah. and did you get stationed in a country yet? Or no. you're working so out of America at this point? The Navy um, boot camp in America oh, so is in boot camp, Chicago. Obviously. Like it's in Great Lakes. Okay, that makes sense. You started a boot camp. Yeah. This is the first, like after going through all the you, you get assigned yeoman, you do all this stuff in like maybe your home state, mm. then you get sent to boot camp. Yeah, they put me on a plane and it was crazy. Like they took me to the airport and I arrived at the airport and I saw a dude wearing a uniform and he just like had the meanest look on his <laughs> face. He was like, sit down, shut the hell up. Oh, and like no. I look over and there's all these dudes, they're like in a single file row. They're all sitting down. They're just quiet, like Indian style and just not a word is spoken. Oh, and I Lord. was like, oh shit. What did I do? <laughs> Got on the plane, went over there, um, and then I we got off the plane, we got marched, and we're on a bus. And we got on the bus, and after we all sat down, a guy got on, and he was like, I better not hear one fucking word. <laughs> and so it was like the quietest, like, I don't remember how long it was. It was like 20, 30, 40 minutes. Hmm. Not a single word was spoken. Everyone wow. was just scared. So they marched <laughs> us in. First thing they do is shave our heads. Mm. Um we take off all of our civilian clothes, mm. put them in a box, and mail it home. Wow. Yeah. And then they assign us all of our uniforms. Mm. And then um, then it's basically routine for the next nine weeks. Wake up whatever time they come, come in screaming at you. Mm. Get out of bed. Stand at attention. Bunk drills. Make your bed. If it sucks, do it again. Mm. They scream at you. Uh, yell at you you do a lot of marching you're tired from marching all day getting yelled at mm. it's just, so i'd say boot camp isn't very hard it's just really tiring yeah it sounds tiring and boring but i've heard amazing benefits to mm. life like that for example there's this one guy like 15 rules or something he's he's talked about this and the first thing you do every single day is you make your bed mm. and then it, it gives you like a sense of completion mm. a lot of small wins will benefit your mind in ways that you really can't imagine. You'll, you'll feel these wins throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So you make your bed. That's like probably the first thing you do every single day. And it's gotta be perfect. So what are some other like little examples? I'm curious that they make you do like you stand at attention. That was another thing. Oh yeah. Uh, super military bearing. Uh, you got to iron your clothes mm. and fold them like so crisp and clean. Otherwise they just open your compartment. Like, cause like, um, we slept in bunk beds and mm. your little, your own personal space was you'd lift up the bed and then there was like a little locker sure. where you would fold all your clothes. So when we'd have inspections, we'd lift up the bed, put the hook up, and then they look at your clothes. And if one thing was fucked up, they just go in there and just rip out all your shit and mm. just throw it across the room. Yeah. And then you'd have to do it all again. Uh, so ironing clothes, folding clothes, um, shaving. Shaving. You had to be clean shaven mm. at all times. Like, the, just the lightest stubble and mm -hmm. they weren't having it. Wow. Um, what else? The way you marched, mm -hmm. the way you spoke to the, your superiors, mm. um, just basically being on point with mm -hmm. everything. Right. So, I mean, I think a lot of people going into something like that aren't, and especially you're 18 or 19, right? 18. Yeah. You're, you're not going to understand the benefits that you're going to be getting from this routine lifestyle. Mm. Did you have um, feelings of like uh, rebellion at all? Or did you like kind of just fall into line? Um, what were your thoughts like as it's happening? So I just basically just shut up and did it. 
Yeah, um, so you weren't like the type that was like, oh, what did I get myself? You were like kind of ready for this life change. At first, yeah. when I first arrived and all, it was so scary. And I was mm. like, what the hell did I do? And I remember when like the first night we got there and the, they, we all sat in this room and this guy was like, all right, if you don't want to be here, mm. raise your hand. And we all looked around at each other and nobody raised that hand. Cause man, if you raise that you hand, they're going to get you. Yeah. And, and like, you're you, probably going to try and stay for at least a couple of weeks, but you're going to get your ass kicked for that week. Yeah. They're, they're, you'll get out, yeah. but they're not going to make it easy <laughs> for you. And I, and I kind of knew that was like a setup, mm. but I, I, I knew boot camp was the hard part. Cause you know, I have military parents, so they kind of mm. told me what it was like. Right. You must've like, had a little insight. Yeah. They were like, just do what you're told. And It'll be done in a few weeks. Exactly. So that's what I did. Um, yeah, I never rebelled. Actually, was um, promoted to the highest ranking um, position as a recruit. Mm. So I was basically the one guy in charge of all 79 other people. Wow, that's cool. And they called it the RPOC. It was like the recruit chief petty officer, mm. which got me an extra stripe mm. directly out of boot camp. I didn't want it, but I got it, and I got stuck with it for so long that I knew all the military drills and mm. the marching calls and all that. So, yeah, that was tough. But <laughs> So, like, when someone screwed up, it fell on me. Mm. When my whole division screwed up, it fell on me. Right. I was the one. But actually, at the same time, because I told you I was trying to lose weight, mm. and the worst thing they can really make you do is just push-ups to your crash and mm. exercises to your crash. So... At the time, I was like, I want to lose weight. So I was like, go ahead, make me do 100 push-ups. Yeah. I want this. Yeah. So like, I was always cool with it. Huh. So this is all boot camp. And mm. how long is it before you're out of it's Chicago, right? Yeah. Michigan. Well, it's uh, outside of Chicago in Great Lakes, mm. a little bit from downtown. And um, so then I was there for nine weeks. And then you go to your A school. A school. Or, which is basically, you know, a school to help you learn what you're going to do. And this is all still in America. Yeah. Um, I, so they then they sent me to Meridian, Mississippi. Mississippi. In the, in the middle of the sticks. Mm. And, you know, at this point, I hadn't skated in nine weeks. So I was itching to skate. But I had, when I got, and it was so sick, my mom hooked it up so hard. Like, <laughs> she came to my boot camp graduation mm -hmm. brought me a suitcase full of like regular clothes mm -hmm. and my skateboard. You had so, worn regular clothes this whole time. Probably. No, not just uniforms. Wow. Yeah. Um, like they, we had Navy PE gear, which mm -hmm. is like sweats sure. and stuff. A little more comfortable than a little more comfortable, but still a uniform basically. Yeah, still a uniform. A hundred percent. Like if you're like walking around on a military base and you're in military PE yeah. gear, like you're still expected to act like you're in uniform. Mm. So yeah, so she, so I'm the only guy in my sailor uniform carrying a skateboard and a suitcase with my clothes. So when I check into my school in Mississippi, they were all looking at me like, where the, how'd you get that? What? And I was just like, my mom hooked it up. <laughs> so I got there and, um, still had to wait a week. Uh -huh. There was like a week of, I had to be on my toes, be good. Mm. And then I was eligible to wear my civilian clothes again. Mm. And that's when I was able to like get on a skateboard again. Sure. So 10 weeks. And the first thing I do is try to Ollie and I just eat shit. Mm. And I, cause my balance was so screwed yeah, up. And I was just skating in a parking lot and I ripped up all my clothes and I, I ate shit so much. I couldn't do anything, mm. dude. It was so tough. Really? It came back you know, after. Sometimes for me, I'll, I'll spend maybe not 10 weeks, but I'll spend like a couple weeks off the board and I'll come back stronger than ever. Just really? like. Yeah, for some reason, I'll be able to like just, you know, feel more strong or maybe it's because I've missed it so much. But sometimes I feel like super on point after mm. like a, a nice like week or two week break. Yeah, it's it's good to have a break. I feel like that too sometimes. But 10 weeks, yeah, I was so off. It came back mm. after a few hours of sure. getting used to it again. But at first it, I was a mess. Mm. And I'm sure everyone was looking at me like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> but it was cool. So I was there. Um, Mississippi, Mississippi, nothing to do except skate this little parking lot. So I was kind of content. But then also go to school as well. So you're you're at you said it's called a school. Yeah, it's called a school. Um, basically you just go in. Uh, it's been so long I can't remember. 
But um, you just go in, you sit at a computer, and like since I was admin, I just mm. typed up correspondence. I just learned what goes where, how mm. to do this, how to file and format, mm. and take. Then I would take test about mm. it, like okay, A, B, C, D, whatever, just mm. easy stuff. So I I was out of there in like four weeks. Mm. Three weeks I graduated, and then the last week I was just waiting to get my orders to go to my first assignment. There were some dudes there. They were there for months. They were just putting it off as long as possible. They're like, they're like, we don't want to go to a ship. We just like it here. You can chill, whatever. And I was like, I want out of here, Mississippi. What in the hell am I doing here? Nothing to do, state. There was nothing, man. It sucked. So, I um. So basically, after a in a school. Mm. You get what they call a dream sheet. Mm. And this, there's three options. And it's kind of, they helps them choose what your first assignment will be. Mm-hmm. So you get three options. One overseas, mm. one east coast, and one west coast. So you do have a little bit of a choice. Well, they can't promise you. Exactly. Because this is what I've heard is like... You know, my friend, he wants to do something cool, but you could end up in like North Carolina. <laughs> and mm. I, I mean, not that that's bad, but for some people, that's the opposite of what they want, which yeah. is to go out of country. And sometimes they will do it. I mean, sometimes you could you circle just, Japan mm-hmm. and end up in Wisconsin. Mm. But I got really lucky. So, and then you get first choice, second choice, third choice. Mm. So first choice, I circled Japan. Mm. Second choice, I circled DC because it was close to where I was from. Mm. And then third choice, I chose like San Diego. Right. And um, so I waited for a week and then I came in one day and they're like, oh, spec, your orders came in and then you're going to uh, ComNav for Korea. Korea. And uh, I was like, oh, which uh, ship am I on? And they're like, nope, no ship, shore duty. And Mm. I was like, fuck, (laughs) yes, dude. I was like, oh, because like after in boot camp, I found out what being on a ship was actually like. And I was like, oh, I fucked up hard, dude. Mm, I was like, I screwed up. So I got really lucky. I got stationed on an army base Mm. in smack dab in the middle of Seoul. Wow. Yeah, I got lucky because there was a Navy base six hours south in a city in a city called Jinhae. Mm. And uh, that is rice patties. (laughs) Like, (laughs) yeah. So I got so lucky. Like I could walk right out of my barracks, get on the metro, and I was like downtown skateboarding soul. Mm. Yeah. Something I want to explore is like my perception of if you join the Navy, the whole experience is like boot camp. And I think some other people, if they know nothing about the Navy, might have this experience as well. But no, this like uh, perception of what the Mm. military and Navy is. But it sounds like it's like a job. You literally, you get stationed somewhere and you work a nine to five, but then- on those times you're not working, you're just a normal civilian. Is that the case? Or yeah. like, it's just like that. Just like that. Um, they even, cause I wasn't sure at first either. And then, um, the last like week of boot camp, you're basically in this graduation phase of where the, your drill sergeants are starting to act cool and mm, be like people right. more down to earth. And like when you would turn a corner in boot camp, like you have to do it sharp, like mm. look sharp and do that. <laughs> and I did it, and the guy was like, dude, if you do that after you leave here, people are going to clown you. And I was like, <laughs> what? So, yeah, it got out. And, um, yeah, it's just a nine to five. Like, you go to work, you wake up, put your uniform on, yeah. and, you know, at all times when you're wearing your uniform, even if you're off duty, you need to be a professional, of right. course. Uh, go to work. I'd finish at 4.30, 5 o'clock, mm. whatever. Go home, put on my regular clothes leave the base and go skateboarding. Sure. And Saturdays and Sundays were free. I mean, naturally, sometimes you're going to work a Saturday and Sunday or mm-hmm. over Like a normal job. Though. Yeah. It's not like... Totally. Okay, but something that I don't get is like, you're in the Navy. You're in the, I guess the Navy is not like the military where like you could be um, called to go to Afghanistan or Iraq. So like, you're in an administrative position, but let's say like World War Three breaks out, the U.S. is going to use all forces possible. Is there a protocol that you're like ready to go to war or? So in boot camp, um, you do learn how to shoot. Mm-hmm. And like I already knew how to shoot. Like I grew up around guns. We lived in Texas sure. for a minute. Um, you learn how to shoot, but you know, not everyone's strong on it. Mm-hmm. There's not like a total protocol. There are like people who are in job that would go to like the front lines per se. Mm. But you know how the, you know how it is now. Like we, 
it wouldn't be like trench warfare if like World War Three broke You're out. Right. Now everything It'd would just be, be like warf- drones yeah. and missiles and whatever. So it's not like anyone would just go to the front and just shoot people. Yeah, there are like Marines and Army soldiers in um, Afghanistan mm-hmm. patrolling and doing all that stuff. But those people kind of sign up for that. Like so. So you think they have enough people that sign up for like the scary stuff, air quotes. So for sure. There's um there's so many people in the military. When I was in, I was in from 2008 to 2011. There was so many people in that they were looking for any good reason to kick you out. Wow. Like if you pop positive on a piss test mm. one time, just, just one time, it was a zero tolerance. If you got a you're DUI, to drink or is it just a you can drink you can on your drink. off time, but if you have an alcohol related incident, you're gonna be finished. Mm. Um, if you were overweight. Well, there's ways around that. But technically, <laughs> if you're overweight and you don't qualify in the PE standards, then mm. you can be kicked out. Um, if you try if you go up for a promotion so many times and you don't and you still don't qualify, you can get kicked out. Mm. If you're not uh competent, you can get kicked out. Um, because there's just there's so many people just signing up every day. Mm. And there's so many people in now because it's such a stable job. Exactly. So it's not like they would just take up all arms and just send everyone. I had the option. You do get to choose if you want to do that. Do what? Go to Afghanistan or go to the Middle East or go to some hazardous. Is that military? They accept Navy to go there as well. All all branches. All all branches. It would, I would have to say it's mostly Marines and Mm. army, but Navy and air force can do it as well. And, um, they pay you a lot of money if you do it. Mm. Like if you're in the military and you're a guy that doesn't have a lot going on and all you do is go to the gym or whatever, Mm. it's a great opportunity to go there and save up bank and just make bank, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's the same with going on a ship for Navy um, because you're out to sea for six months at a time with the occasional port call, Mm. nothing to do, nothing to spend your money on. You're just saving up bank. Yeah, yeah. So they will give you extra pay to do this and like especially if you're in hazardous duty zones the second mm. you put boots on the ground in a hazardous duty zone that's a month of tax-free pay mm. and if so if you're there for 12 months that's a year of tax-free pay so you're making money so there's a lot of ins and outs to knowing the financial system like how to like play it a little bit yeah like people like how do you learn that kind of stuff um as an administrative assistant oh i, I guess yeah you're on the in lot. yeah I you're came on the ac- in in like do you see the back end of everything Ooh, i saw a lot of it um, are you, is it any bit confidential or like oh yeah tons of confidential. so there's a lot of stuff you can't say there's a lot of stuff i can't say mm. um because i did have a secret clearance i came a lot across interesting i came across a lot of confidential stuff mm. but so i learned a lot being in but still not as much as i'd want to but Still learn a lot. Wow, that's super interesting. I mean, I'm going to poke around and you can just stop me if I say anything mm. you can't answer. But something, the first thing that comes to mind is military spending. You know, there's a ton of the military. I, I, maybe you can educate me a little bit, but this number might be off like $600 billion the, the, is the annual um, amount that the, gov- uh, that the military spends on like weaponry. Do mm. you know anything about like budgets? To be honest, that's way over my head. Way over your head. That's yeah. I I dealt with nothing like that. Okay. I couldn't tell you. Those are for the guys in DC. Okay, so that's just way over. Your head. I basically what I did was I just dealt with the people who worked within my command. Okay, so a very very small like circle of stuff of that's going on within the. Your well, branch. depending like when I was in Italy, mm. my uh my boss, the four star admiral, was mm. a very big deal. Like he was commander for all of naval forces europe and Mm. africa as well as nato wow so he was a very big deal but in korea it was just a one-star admiral and we just dealt with you know guys within our command Mm. and then i dealt with a little bit more in italy Mm. but still mostly just sticking to the guys i work Mm. closely with so big navy big military no that's that's way over my head way over your head do you have any opinion on military spending it seems to be a big um topic of discussion in america right now i mean like there's issues with healthcare there's issues with education and for some reason military spending is far and above any other sector of spending that the government does yeah i mean i couldn't give you exact numbers and figures but i could 
definitely agree with that. Yeah. Well, well, from your perspective as in the military, do you think that there's, there's money that goes to waste or do you think like they're truly using the money? Cause like, I want a secure nation. I think that's extremely important. For sure. Um, I think that is an excuse they use a lot Mm. just to put people at ease. Mm. I don't, a lot of it goes into pockets Mm. and a lot of it might be wasted because you know, war is all about money. Have you ever seen the movie Lord of War with Nicolas Cage? Uh, no. So this movie, Lord of, I believe it's called Lord, Lord of War with Nicolas Cage. Basically, it starts out as this guy who he's like a, I think Ukraine or Soviet um, expat in America. There's like growing up, living, and eventually he gets this opportunity to sell his first gun, mm. and he sells a gun in Uzi to so so whatever. But the movie ends up proceeding to him eventually getting military contracts and selling guns to all different types of people and. That it's, sounds like that movie War Dogs with like Jonah Hill. It's exactly and, like that. And War yeah. Dogs is like the the same, um, you know, not metaphor, but the same example. Yeah. So you've seen War Dogs? Yeah. Yeah. How crazy is that? You know, these like, jo- it's not whatever his name is in the movie, but Jonah Hill and someone else, they go to like Afghanistan and, you know. They're, Channing they're, Tatum? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's Channing, but <laughs> yeah, it's some other handsome dude, whatever that he's with. And yeah, that is so crazy that. It, some the, just it blows my mind that they le- that there's a privatized industry to selling military equipment to you know what I mean? Yeah, that I before that movie I couldn't have told you that ever happened. Like yeah. like I said, those are those that's are based all on in, true stories. Yeah, I couldn't have ever told you that happened. Like I wouldn't had no idea that goes mm. on, and that's probably only the tip of the iceberg. Sure. You know? So yeah, I think a lot of it does go. Unfortunately, to waste. To waste mm-hmm. and to other places it shouldn't go. Mm. But I guess that's politics. It is politics. And I can't speak on it. I'm not educated enough. And if you want to, we can move on because I'm, I'm a little more curious in, um, so you're in Seoul, but then you, you when did you do your next move? Because you said so, Italy, right? Um, yeah. So I was in Seoul for a year um, because that's how long the orders were for, just mm. one year. So when it came time to leave, maybe like three months before, I talked with the Navy counselor I worked with, mm. and I had the option of staying. I could, you know, resign for one more year in Seoul or move on. Mm. And I we went through the list of all these places to go, and I wanted to go to Europe because I'd never been to Europe, and yeah. I saw this as a perfect opportunity to do it. Looking back, I would have stayed in Seoul because Seoul was awesome. Like it was back in two thousand eight. Like. I oh, couldn't wow. have told you what Shanghai was like 2008, and I don't couldn't tell you what Seoul is like now, mm. but 2008 Seoul was pretty awesome. In what so, way? Just, it was the first, I, I don't know, maybe um, it was the first time that I was lived abroad, mm-hmm. like technically, I was 18, I was in Asia, mm-hmm. I was in a like when they told me I was going to Korea, I was like, what's that? <laughs> what's that? I was like, I couldn't have pointed it yeah. on a map. Yeah, I was sure. I was like, Korea, like, what's that? Hmm. And they're like, and then I found it and I Googled it in Seoul and I was like, oh, it looks pretty cool. <laughs> so um, I could drink. Sure. There was like 18. not really a drinking age. Hmm. By uh, military standards, I wasn't supposed to because they wanted to keep it 21 Mm -hmm. because there was a lot of alcohol-related incidents with the army, like, you know, getting drunk and beating up taxi drivers and raping women and (sighs) shit, man. They did all kinds of stupid shit. Like, because that's what happens. You send young 18-year-olds that have never been outside of America before. Even sometimes. Yeah, Yeah. and they do these stupid things. But luckily, you know, as a skateboarder, I felt like I've always had a level head. Mm. And I feel like skateboarding has kind of helped me with that. Mm. So... Um, I had, I met so many friends cause like I said, skateboarding helps you make friends. Like I got in really close with the Korean homies. Um, I was still 18. So there was an international school somewhere in the area. Mm. So there was a lot of, I met a lot of British cats, a lot of Canadians, a lot of Americans, mm. these kids, they were all going to this international school. High school. Yeah. High school. Okay. 15, 16, 17, but it didn't matter cause I was 18. So like, we're all basically the same age anyways. Mm. So I was hanging out with all these dudes. We were going to clubs. We were uh, drinking, smoking, whatever. I didn't do drugs because, you know, military, sure. your analysis on the often, but mm-hmm. I was still, you having know, just time. partying yeah. it up, having a great time. Um, I didn't 
mess with women, mm -hmm. didn't care, just skateboarding, drinking, just yeah. running amok. <laughs> and it was amazing. And it was, everyone was cool with skateboarding back then. Like, it was awesome. That's pretty So dope. that's why I really liked it. So like I was saying. um, So this is 2008 to when? 2009. Oh, so only one year in Seoul. Only one year. Okay. And it went by way too fast. Hmm. I miss those days. That was so you, maybe the you best year. You couldn't resign on Seoul. You, I could. Oh, so, but you decided to go somewhere else. I I really wanted to go to Europe. Okay. I really wanted to see what that was all about. So um, we look at the orders and like Germany pops up. Hmm. You know, being born in Germany, being Man. German descent, all that stuff. I was like, I want to go to Germany. Do it. Um, and then I got selected to go to Germany, mm -hmm. and I was super excited. I called my family up. I was like, Yeah, I'm going to Germany. <laughs> And they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to come visit you. It's going to be mm. sweet. And then like a month later, they're like, oh, well, no, you can't go to Germany anymore. So I think some backdoor stuff and they gave it to someone else. I was mm. pretty sour with the Navy after that. Yeah, that's a little upsetting. Yeah, I was very upset. So the only other Europe option on there was Naples, Italy, mm. which if you ask Andrea or Amerigo, <laughs> they'll tell you, wow, that sucks. But um, so but I was and I heard a lot about it too from other service members mm. had been through there or had lived there and they were like, dude, that place sucks. Don't go there. Really? Yeah. And they a lot of people referred to it as the armpit of Europe. Mm. And I was like, whatever, dude. And like, it's not that bad. You guys are just haters. Like, mm. I can find somewhere to skate and like make friends and just, you know, it'll be cool. Yeah, like different. whatever, screw those negative guys. So I went there and then I called my family up. I was like, oh, well, they screwed me over. Now I'm going to Italy. And they're like, well, see you in two years then. And I was like, oh, you guys suck. <laughs> so I went to Italy after that. And yeah, I was, I was bored out of my mind. Like so the rumors were true. Yeah. <laughs> like I want, so I don't say it was as bad as everyone said, but it mm. wasn't. As good as Seoul. Okay. But I was still in Europe and I still got to travel around Europe and I got to go to Barcelona nice. for my first time as a young skateboarder dreaming of Barcelona. Yeah, Barcy's the dream. And so I was happy for that opportunity. Mm. And, but like as we're living in Italy, I mean, the food was amazing. Of course. But like the skateboarding, no, it wasn't. Cause you know, like these streets were like, Cobble. 2000 years old dude like <laughs> julius caesar was walking on the same street that's wild and naples had a real trash problem mm. at the time like the city was like drowning in trash wow it was really bad and it had something to do with the mafia like threatening like the lives of like the people who took out the trash i guess it cost money to mm. do that and they weren't trying to spend that money wow that's and then other story. parts of europe were sending trash to naples sounds like jersey you know people send the trash to new jersey in america yeah so and that's interesting there's like a mafia connection to jersey in new york as well i have no idea what i'm talking about but well like, there's um if there's a lot of italians there then i wouldn't doubt it hmm. and um there's a big italian community in long island and new york and there's there's a Vice documentary. It's like a two or three part documentary that you should watch if you ever get the time. And it talks about the trash in Naples. Really? Yeah. And the problem is it's that interesting of a topic that there's been documentaries made about it. It's like it's the trash it's bad. problem in Naples. It's bad. So is this gone or this happened in like 2009? 2000? So this was 2009 to 2011. So from what I've heard, it's getting better, but I'm not 100%. So it's still an ongoing problem, but it was pretty bad 10 years ago. It was really bad like if you because like i had to have a car in naples so like if i drove to work and it was raining mm. the streets were so old and cobblestone like it would flood and then when it flooded all the trash would just oh my god like all over the streets and like then traffic was horrible it would take me maybe an hour to get so far as the metro station from your apartment what because just like gridlock just not just moving. like there would only be like one way to get through this puddle and mm. this trash. And then like it, people like ch, 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 come in and from all different directions. And you have to be aggressive mm. to drive in Southern Italy. Like they are so aggressive. Oh, I have man. never had so many people get out of their cars and kick my car and like try to like mess me up. Like I was living in Naples. Wow. It was, it got scary sometimes, dude. Like people, there are really aggressive. Like, and it was funny because I lived in Seoul 
when I was living in Seoul, do you remember my barracks? My barracks. The uh, the barracks had just recently started, and then they were trying their own social media thing really? for skateboarders, my and barracks. it was called My Barracks. No, I never <laughs> like MySpace. Just yeah, kind of yeah. It off. That's I, basically what it was. I never heard of that. And um, so I made an account, and I was searching for Italian skateboarders through there, mm. and I finally got through to one, and I was like, "Hey, man, like I'm going to move to Italy soon, and I wanted to hit you up and see what Naples is like," and he. The only response I got was, I won't go to Naples. I'm too scared. What? And I was just like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> That's from a local Italian. You hear that kind of message, you're going to be turned off. I would. That's crazy. Dude, I was like, I was like, oh, shit, I fucked up. But I still wanted to go to Europe. I was like, no, screw it. I can still make it. Yeah. And it wasn't like a hundred. It wasn't that bad. Mm. I still made friends. There were still spots. I ate good food. Mm. Um, the countryside was beautiful yeah. like if you drove outside of the city like down the coast because all along the Amalfi coast it was just beautiful dude sure. like yeah there were downfalls of living there but there was also a lot of ups and like it was really nice and i lived out in town i had the nicest landlord in the world mm. if i had a problem he was there within 10 minutes wow. fix everything he'd invite me and my neighbor over to his place and his whole family would cook dinner for us mm. once a month. And we'd be out at his place from eight at night to one in the morning eating and drinking and just getting all kinds of messed up. And it was just, so it was, it was not that bad, mm. but there were times I was like, Oh fuck, I'm ready to go. <laughs> but you spent two years there. So did you resign during like that after one year? Or? No, this one was a two year. So you had to do a two year contract. Yeah. But I didn't, finish my two-year contract so because i was so ready to get out of naples mm. um and i didn't even do the four full year didn't do the full four years sure. in the military i requested to get out early mm. because um i was just over it yeah and i wanted to go and i was over my three-year mark to get the gi bill mm. and at the same time i was talking to my friend who was living in tokyo and he was going to this university and i was like i'm ready to get out now I want, I'll come live with you because, um, he was living in, I knew him from Maryland mm. and he was there. His parents got a job on the military base as civilians, not, they mm. weren't in the military as military civilians. They were retired military. Mm. So they got a job on the base and he was living with them going to this university in Japan. Right. And I was like, well, you know, the whole reason I joined the military is, or well, a big part of it was so I could go to Japan mm -hmm. and then go get the GI bill. So yeah. I was like, oh, this is great. Like, I was like, we can live together and skate together and go to uni together. And we're in Japan. Like, yeah. that's what I want. So I requested to get out early, got out like five months early hmm. and then uh, went to Japan. That's awesome. So yeah. directly from uh, Italy, you go to Japan or did you, you did a stop in? Um I had to go to Norfolk, Virginia. Which mm -hmm. is kind of like a huge for like discharge and that yeah, kind of stuff. Basically, oh, just okay. get discharged. Uh, then I spent like maybe a month with my mom, mm. hanging out, um, and then I went to Japan, mm -hmm. waiting for like the semester to start. Pretty and awesome. Then, yeah, got there and just started my new life. Yeah. So you did? Did you do a full year, four years in in Japan? Yeah, I did. So it's four years at Temple. What did you study? Okay, so um, when I joined. Oh, I studied communications studies. Mm -hmm. Right. So you already have like the pre-education. Like the military in and of itself is an education. So you you get an education like an administration and that that's kind of why you chose communication or? No, I chose communications because Temple University in Japan only offered, offers, offered, I don't know, maybe it's different now, but mm -hmm. at the time they only offered seven majors. Hmm. Seven majors. Yeah. I was well. like, and I still had no idea what I wanted right. to do. So, but my friend was studying communications. Mm. And then I looked, sat down and I looked at the other ones like IB. I was like, screw that. There's a lot of math. Yeah. I, I can't do math, dude. Mm. And then there was political science. And I was like, oh, I'm not a political guy. I don't care about that stuff. Also, mm. although I did do a minor in political science. Mm. And then there were, there was Japanese and I was like, why do I want to major in Japanese? Yeah, it's pretty that. specific. Yeah. I was like, that's if you want to like 
go full like otaku like <laughs> be like a weird japanese person sure, like sure. or like be like a weird white person that <laughs> wants to be japanese yeah. and man my university was full of those I weirdos yeah, dude yeah. It, ugh, it was cringe worthy mm. but so i was like no um and then there was a few other ones i was like whatever so even like came to the end like communications was the most level headed one to choose mm-hmm. so i just did that yeah yeah, that's pretty cool. So you get to skate a bunch there and then you leave and you end up in China. So now you're ready to leave China. Like we're, we're at right now. So what were yeah. the, what were the decisions that like led to it's time to go? So before I came to China, I thought in my head, I'd only do two years and then yeah. make my next move. But I might've said this earlier. Yeah. Um, but now it's been four and you're, but now it's been four and I'm really like, it's time to go. Mm-hmm. Um, so I chose this time to leave because it's at the end of my current contract right, with right. my school because you know i'm a big boy and i'm not gonna just like say screw you i'm leaving tomorrow no, that's like i'm gonna finish my contract all that. Yeah. and then you know leave on a good note and then you know um basically and a lot of your other guests have talked about this mm. shanghai is just not the same yeah. anymore yeah. it's um it's changed so much. And like, it was not the same Shanghai for like Charlie mm. or John when I came four years ago, yeah. but it's not even the same Shanghai for me. Like when I yep. came four years ago, it's mm-hmm. totally different and it's not fun yeah, anymore. It's a little limiting. It just feels the vibe, the feeling of the city has changed. And it's not something you could put into words and it's not something that you can really like, uh, there's, there's some things that you can put into words, but it's just not really worth it. It's hard for me to explain because I work with a bunch of guys in my school now mm. that are basically newbies mm. and they're like, they can't understand the feeling that I have right now because right. like they're new. They're like, wow, Shanghai, it's big, it's mm-hmm. cool, it's fun. Yeah. And I'm like, huh, huh. Uh, yeah, it was different. There's like that mama hoo-hoo. Mama hoo-hoo. There's like that one skit where there's the guy sitting at the bar and then um, two other foreign guys walk in and they're like, yeah, I just got here. I'm going to learn Chinese and do all this stuff. And the guy at the bar just starts laughing. And he's like, ha, 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 ha. Oh, I remember I was like you once. And they're like, mm. whatever, dude. And then like it flashes to the future. Mm. And then both of those dudes are joining him at the bar. And like some other guys walk in. They're like, wow, we just got here. It's cool. <laughs> and then they're all, all of them at the bar. They're like, ha, what a joke. <laughs> and I feel like that guy at the bar. Yeah. Where I'm talking to them, I'm like, huh, yeah, well, mm. I remember. I feel you. So so you're ready to leave now. What's the plan for, you're moving to Texas, right? Okay, so um, it's not definite. Mm. I um, am going to Texas because that's where my mom and my grandmother currently live. And back in Abilene. Back in Abilene. Play, never thought I'd be there again, mm. but here I go. Um, it's just cause she lives there now. Mm. So it's a good place for me to go and get my feet back on the ground. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to live. The plan is, well, I wanted to move down to Austin cause mm. I heard a lot of cool things about it. I've never been there myself, but, um, I've also started thinking, what about Hawaii or what mm. about San Diego? Or I've even sent applications to New Zealand. And I've also thought, what if I just kept teaching English and moved to Thailand or mm. Vietnam? So there's just a whole bunch of things going on in my head. So first, I'm just going to go there, kind of hang out, spend some time with my family, because mm-hmm. I haven't lived in America in 11 years. I was going to say the same thing. I've, I haven't, I mean, not 11 years, but I haven't lived in America career-wise ever. Like directly after college, I, I came out to China. Yeah. So, and I guess it's kind of the same for you. Directly after high school, you did everything abroad, military, um, education uni and uh work life mm. all out of america so i i'm curious like because i've i've gotten a little anxious about moving back to america like when the time comes preparing for that culture change so how have you thought about it you know i haven't thought much about it mm. um i have in like small doses there are some days where i'm really excited for it and there's other days where i feel really anxious about mm. it and it's just kind of like it hasn't really even sunk in yet. Like, I think until I get on that plane, like that's when it's gonna sink in. Yeah. Um, 
because now like I'm still going to work. My last day is this Friday. So I still feel like everything's the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I still live in the same apartment. I'm still going to work. So nothing has really changed yet. So it hasn't really sunk in that mm. I'm like leaving yet, even though it's a week away. Um, yeah, man, I just, I really don't know. And I also want to take this time, kind of figure out what's important to me, mm. who I am, what I'm going to do. Because I definitely can't keep teaching English. Mm. Like this was a good means to an end yep. to live in Shanghai. But I've kind of come to the decision that I'm tired of being a white monkey. <laughs> and teaching English, there's no, at least not here, there's mm. no future in it. Yeah. I could stay at my current job for the 20 more years yeah. and I would be in the same position I am right now. Yep. And it's just, there's, it doesn't teach me anything. Mm. Um, I've learned all I could do, which was not a whole lot, was maybe, maybe like public speaking. Now I don't feel so uncomfortable speaking mm -hmm. in front of like a group sure. of people. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like it's done for me. Like there's, it's not going to progress any further. Mm. Well, listen, man, I, I really appreciate the talk. I, I'm excited for you, what you're going to do in the future. I think you're a man who, you know, kind of jumps into things without knowing fully what's going to happen. And mm -hmm. that takes a lot of courage and I'm excited for you. I wish you good luck in America. Are you kicking me off? Is it time already? It's time. We did over an hour. Can you believe that? I, I can. I <laughs> I actually can. I feel like I rambled on way no, too No, dude, much. this was really good. Thank you so much. I think I learned a lot about the military. That's my biggest takeaway. So mm. thank you for coming on. Yeah, man. I'm, thanks for having me. I'm glad we could make this happen before yeah, I left. Especially right before you leave. Yeah. So I think it's come at a good time and I think... Um, I like what you're doing with the Shanghai Observe thing, man. It's really good. You got a huge following. It's crazy. I remember when you first started this, yeah. and now you even got your own podcast. It's really cool. Yeah, this has been the podcasting is what I'm most excited about. Do you get a lot of listeners? I I'm I'm averaging about like 200 downloads per episode. Oh, that's good. I've gotten like a thousand downloads, and for me, that's dude, a thousand people listening to me just talk. Yeah, that's super. Um, like makes me feel so good. Just like my thoughts and my, my guests thoughts. I, mm. I'm so excited about this. And that's about, only the beginning. Yeah. Just pursuing interviewing and kind of journalism has been so much fun, like learning new things in, in a way that I never experienced before. Mm. Um, so that's me. I'm, I'm excited about this future. I'm glad you're doing it. I think you're doing, making good moves. Thank so. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the show. Glad, uh, I could teach you a little <laughs> bit about the military and hopefully people listening to this right now are enjoying it. Yeah. I don't know who wants to listen to me, but <laughs> maybe they're inspired to join the military themselves. No, no. I, I, I don't think it's a bad career choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You deal with a lot of BS, but at what job do you not? Definitely. Well said. All right, guys. Thanks, Rich. All right. Peace. Peace. Boom. That's it. Thanks so much for listening. I really am excited about how this podcast is turning out, but I can always improve. I would love to hear your feedback. If you want to reach out and suggest I talk about something specific or have a specific guest on, you can email me at shanghaiobserved at gmail.com. That is shanghaiobserved at gmail.com. Also, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by shanghaiobserved.com slash shop. That's right. I'm plugging my own shop. It means so much that people already buy my stuff. If you want to support me, you can go to shanghaiobserved.com and buy a shirt or whatever's on there right now. Uh, even if you buy a sticker, it, it really supports and helps me do what I love to do. I owe it all to you guys. Thank you so much for listening and supporting me. Thanks a bunch. Peace, guys. Also, if you enjoyed the intro and outro music, it was made by my brother, Danny Greenberg. You can go and check out his beats at soundcloud.com slash estoric, E-S-T-O-R-I-C. Okay, that's it for now. Peace.